Welcome to the Smarter Trading Podcast. If you want to sharpen your trading skills or become a more savvy investor, then you're in the right place. Every week, we sit down with professional traders who are ready to share practical insights on what it takes to succeed in modern day markets. Smarter Trading, the show to watch to trade smarter. Medeiros is the founder and CEO of The Trade Risk. All opinions expressed by guests are solely their own opinions and do not reflect the opinion of Evan or The Trade Risk. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as the basis for investment decisions. Evan and guests may maintain positions in securities discussed in this podcast. Welcome back, everyone, to Smarter Trading. I'm your host, Evan Medeiros, and today I am joined by Anne Marie Band. Anne-Marie is the president and CEO of thetradingbook.com and has been trading since 2005. Her trading strategies are based on technical support and resistance levels with special attention given to trader psychology at key market inflection points. She is a regular contributor to StockTwits and Benzinga and is active across social media. Anne-Marie, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me, Evan. It's good to see you after a year of being at home. Yeah, yeah. What a year it's been. And we have. We've 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 met a few times in person. And what I love about you is you're always so smiley and positive. And it is always such a pickup at, you know, sometimes some some quiet events. So I appreciate your energy when we meet in person and I also have to say that you know how to fill a presentation room, so you're going to have to give me your secrets. I don't know if you're bringing snacks or something for, you know, put put it in the corner because my rooms do not look like your rooms when we give presentations. So I appreciate that greatly. Is, that is I awesome. did have I did have one um session that I did once where a guy came in and he was late from lunch and he brought in a tuna salad sandwich and said, "Right, <laughs> on the floor in the middle of everything because there were no seats left. Oh man. That yeah. That no. Yeah. Anyways. That's funny. Um so one thing I didn't mention in your background is your formal education was in mathematics. Yes. And from what I can tell, stocks trading, the markets, they weren't on your radar when you graduated or in your early career. So not remotely. Take us back into sort of how you transitioned. What was the flipping point from corporate to finance? Yeah. So, you know, as a neuroscience researcher, which is what I started off as when I got out of school, it was very hard to make a living. It was just, you know, grinding out work with of uh, very egotistical brain surgeons. And it was just really unfulfilling work. Loved the work, didn't like the people around the work. And so I met a woman who said, well, I run an agency for placing technical people. So why don't you come and work for me? I met her and, and uh, I went to work in the recruiting space recruiting technical people. And after a few years with her, I just broke out on my own. Um, mostly because I didn't want to take, you know, an eighth of what she was making. And right. So I said, you know, I'm going to go into business for myself. So I had uh, a recruiting company for about 14 years, but that is very, very intensive work. And it's dawn to dusk and you're still managing people a lot of people managing expectations on both sides. It's it's difficult work, especially if you run both sides of the house and and you are responsible for, you know, a lot of the revenue generation. And so I said, you know, I'm tired of this and I was in a good enough place to go, I can push this off and sell it 
and take what I have and do something totally different. And so for about 15 years, I'd been studying the psychology of how people make decisions because there I was on the phone with them going, no, listen, here's what you have to think about. You have to think about X, Y, and Z. And so I learned about how people were making decisions, where they were fearful about things. And then I had all this mathematics background and I took some of my employees to uh, an event and it was uh, one of those success magazine events. Mm -hmm. And a guy was up there talking about technical analysis and he made it look so simple. I was like, how hard can this be? Come right. on. And so <clears throat> I said, you know, I'm tired of working from dawn to dusk. <laughs> I think I'll go into the trading space. And once you get in here, you realize it is dawn to dusk work also, right? You're just calling the shots, right? Sure. And, and that great accountability was good for me. I was not afraid of it because I've always really wanted to work for myself and function better if I was just given the work and left alone, because I'm naturally a very introverted person. So I like being alone with the charts and that sort of thing. And the markets just, I felt like everything I'd learned in my life had just come together. And it, I it was the place for me, you know, that old adage of find something you love. You never work a day in your life. I feel like I'm working. <laughs> Don't get me wrong. <laughs> but I love the work. I do. I love, I love watching the anticipation. And the only time, you know, you get really sometimes wound up about it is if you're anticipating and you're working on it and all of a sudden you've picked the wrong side and you have to turn around and, you know, do it all over again. And so that big thing about the biggest thing that I learned was managing the risk because I have no idea where the markets are going, but I can say this is where I stop. And so because that is where my real power sits, I must develop controls around that power to keep me permanently fixated on keeping between the lines of risk. Because as you know, most people who try to trade will run out of money before they learn the mechanics. And it's because they don't set that risk protocol properly. I mean, the perfect background, the, the studying of I know. human decision, like that combined with mathematics, I, I don't think I've heard someone that is more like ready and prepared and we're never ready, but but yes, has the actual um, ingredients as to what makes a successful trader in most cases. So you started on the technical side. You never got into fundamentals or, or like trying to go down that route when you first got started. No, I, I really I didn't. First of all, I never. I never liked that part of everything. Yeah. Um, so no, I, I wanted to see what people were doing and I could tell what they were doing by staring at the charts. I couldn't really tell what was going to happen by reading the fundamentals. It never made sense to me about price to book because I could never go, all right, as a mathematician and a statistician, I'm looking for correlation, not not causation, but correlation. And I could never see those tight correlation events working for me. That makes sense. So I think a good way to sort of break into your trading approach is to have you explain a hashtag you have in your Twitter profile, which is UDA. And oh. I think you are paying sort of respect to the OODA loop. Yes. And I'd love to know, well, A, could you sort of tell us what that is and then how it sort of relates to your trading strategy? Absolutely. So the anchor of all my decision-making and a reminder of how our minds work come from this thing called an OODA loop. The OODA loop was developed by a gentleman by the name of John Boyd, and he was in the Air Force, and he was um, 
an engineer of sorts, but his job was to try to make the environment for pilots safer. And so he built something that every fighter pilot still uses today, and it's called the OODA loop. It's observe, meaning observe your surroundings, orient, orient yourself relative to those surroundings, decide, and then act. And every single spot, every single point is iterative. So you observe, and when you get to orient and you're orienting yourself, you make sure that what you've observed is still sitting in place. And if those two things are aligned, then you say, all right, this says that when I see these things, this is going to be most probable. And so when this comes, that's my decision point, then I'm going to act. And so when I act, I expect an outcome. So I'm going to observe for that outcome. If that outcome happens, then I'm going to orient myself again to say, okay, should I add? If that outcome doesn't happen, then I orient myself and go, was I wrong? And then I go back to acting after I've decided from those observations. So what we have a tendency to do as traders is observe and act. <laughs> we don't orient ourselves. I hear things like this all the time. Oh, it's lost the 50. I've got to go short. What? Statistically speaking, most of the time, if you lose a 50 simple moving average, the very next line afterwards is a bounce. <laughs> And so people pick the wrong thing because they're not looking for signal. They're actually listening to general heuristics, right? It's, ooh, what does somebody say about that? And what does somebody say about this? And because everybody wants the holy grail, just tell me one thing. Just tell me where to buy. Mm -hmm. Just tell me where to sell. And if it were that easy, right. it wouldn't look like this kind of triangle with a lot of us on the bottom and only a teeny tiny few on the top, right? And so this notion of learning to realize that you're in a kayak in rapids and understanding directional flow makes all the difference in the world. You know, many times... We look at things and we go, oh, you know, I've missed this move. I just have to look for the reverse. And that kills a person anyway. And so this OODA loop tells us, wait a second. If this is what you're going to do, you observe and then you orient. If you see a break of the 50, but that 50 is a, an upward moving average, they're going to buy it. They're going to buy it. They're going to come in and go, ooh, that's value. I'm going to buy it. And so you're going to sit on the wrong side of the trade if you think those sorts of things. And so this orientation event of how does the market feel? How do participants feel about this price? And you can really tell that by just taking some time and looking at the candlesticks. And what a lot of us do is we're the hair trigger on the mouse, and then we get in and go, oh, wait, I think that's the wrong way. Such good advice. It's just so applicable. I mean, you could build this trading strategy system just using that. Absolutely. You can see that is the ingredients, and that's probably the proper way to do it because – like you say, uh, there are so many, there are so many heuristics and this is another side tangent, but like I, I, I had this thought where we have so many cliches in the trading community that are just flat out yeah, wrong, wrong or they just deserve a lot more context. Um, golden crosses, losing the 50 SMA yes. and, and a new trader, unfortunately is going to quickly gravitate to those types of things because yes. they're so neat and packaged Yes, and, and they, and they're like, Ooh, that, that sounds good. But then right. as you know, and I tried those things and you realize, okay, that, you know, that didn't, work. didn't work or exactly. I'm breaking even at best mm -hmm. or, or something like that. Right. Um, so I think that's super important. So you trade futures, futures. primarily. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you trade stocks or? I do, but on a swing. 
right? Yes. I do stocks and options on swing, on swing that trades. Makes sense. So mm -hmm. intraday futures, yes. swing trading, sort of the stocks and options. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, now in terms of futures, are you treating those markets the same? Uh, because I imagine you're going out into commodities as well. And does, you know, corn behave similar? Can you apply yeah, your strategy? Everything. That's the great thing because the common denominator is the human carbon, right? Whether we are programming the algorithms or sitting there live because we have a feel for it, because we all have the same DNA in terms of the fear of loss, the fear of missing out, um, all of those things, they look exactly the same on the charts. The, the things that make instruments individual is that many times we like to revisit the same places, same price points. And so that will divide things a little bit, but a simple review of a weekly or a monthly chart will tell you. And it's always, you know, if, if you were to say, hey, what's your secret sauce? I would say, one, I always know the maximum amount I'm going to lose. And two, I'm always conscious of what kind of battle is currently being waged and whether it's worthwhile for me to get involved at that price point. And so I'll just wait. A lot of times that annoys a lot of people that are saying, hey, what do you do there? Waiting is just a, an anchor of my work during the day. Do I want to participate at this price level? No, because big money is not there. So I'm going to wait for big money to get to send price to where it was the last time, and then I'll participate there. And those sorts of things really, I think for a trader to say, how do I get good? Realize that it's not the best time every time. And some environments are better than others. And the market is essentially a long vehicle. We don't invest in companies because we hope they go broke. We don't buy an initial offering because we think it's going to get delisted. We Everything in the market is, I'm going to invest so I have money when I retire. I'm going to invest so that I can make a solid return over the next week, month, year. And knowing that the market is essentially long, it tells you there are places where patient people are going to always be waiting for value. And sometimes they're going to be wrong because the market's going to be in a space of deeper retracement, but enough of them are going to come in there and bounce. And if it bounces only a little and it doesn't bounce a lot, then you go, hmm, I think I might be in the wrong direction. So I'm going to trim some of my exposure here because I don't want the wheels to come off the bus. What we have a tendency to do is chase, ooh, this is run 30%. Somebody said it was going to be 150% by XYZ, and we buy without even thinking about, well, who else is participating there? And that really, it takes a lot of thinking. You know, I do a face plant in the bed every night. <laughs> I'm done. I leave it all out on the field. And there's a lot of thinking. You got to go, hmm, all right, if I did that, what's really happening here? And, and that makes the game both individual, but also, if you're looking for where big players are going to sit, you're going to have the wind at your back instead of in your face. You know, it's it's an approach that I sort of took when I started, or when I st after I got through the initial testing and you know doing this the silly stuff, um, but the necessary stuff to learn. It was really sort of framing out the market always in a price action relationship of 
buyers and sellers, who's more motivated, who's got the upper hand. Let's see where that strength is. And when you get to that purity, you almost don't need many other technical indicators. You're, you're seeing it unfold in the range of the bars and the wicks and the overlap. Like that all sort of tells the story of kind of what you need to do. And it's just a matter of the trader if they can sort of align to it. And it's, it's back to this OODA loop, right, of just reorienting to that strength. So I love that. I, I, I super appreciate that. I love talking with traders that have that mentality because it is so dynamic. But you hit on sort of the next question. It is so draining. It can be so draining because you're, you're involved. You're checking in. You're checking in. And you're thinking about it. If you have a bad day trading or, or you're just drained there, how do you not let that affect your everyday occurrence when you have to eventually shut down the screen? Because that's a tough, what that's a, a tough great part. question. It is, you know, and the reason it is, is because when, when we trade poorly, we somehow look at ourselves and we have very negative self-talk. It's you're an idiot or what a moron or, you know, whatever you're going to say, it's this terrible negative self-talk and the market has a way of making our bad trades make us feel bad about us. <clears throat> and that's very hard. In the very beginning, I could not separate that. If I had a bad day, I would chill my fingernails off and uh, sit in the shower and cry for 45 minutes or you know, um, shut down and just go straight to bed and read a book and really dissociate from my family and friends. And it really, really suffered because I, I was feeling so bad about myself. I couldn't tell them about my failures because then it would feel even more bad. So you keep it all in. So I finally realized that we are not our trades. What we do have to be is accountable to risk and process. And so if we build that framework where we've got those boundaries of have you set yourself accountable to risk? Has that risk been managed properly? And are you still following your protocol every single day? Once you do that, when the trades go bad, if you've done your work, you can go luck at the draw. That was the hand of, of, that was a game of chess I lost. That was a hand of poker I lost. And although it doesn't feel great, it never feels great to lose. You don't have that debilitating, oh my gosh, why can't I get this? Why is this so hard? What's wrong with me? Kind of thing that we really do as traders. And so that sort of uh, belies the point of, hey, you better find a process that is manageable and that you have risk around. And that's as simple as when I get support retested, if I'm in a positive trend, I'm simply going to go long and my stop's going to be X, right? You can have very simple trading mechanics and do really well if you hold yourself accountable to your losses and to your process. I love it. Yeah, it takes and it and it takes work. You've done the work. You've put in the work on yourself, right? Because that yes. to me is always the hardest part yeah. when I think about yeah, when I think about the the discretionary sort of price action trader, I'm on board with everything. It's the it's that psychological side, it's the emotional side, it's beating yourself up when all you can think about is the, you know, the losses from the day, but you're right. It is about the process. It's it's just doing the work to understand, yes, follow the rules, follow my risk management, just another day in paradise. You know, the thing we battle with is the fear of being wrong. Yeah. In our 
in our normal world outside of the trading environment, we're really ridiculed for being wrong. All you have to do is look at social media. I mean, people are absolutely horrific if you do the wrong thing. And so there's this deep fear, oh my gosh, what if I'm wrong? And the answer, if you've got a structure, is then I lose X. And it stops being, well, then I'm a loser. Or then I'm going to, you know, you really have to build the playground that you're playing in. Or it's, you know, going to be a house of horrors. It truly will be, right? And if you damage your emotional capital, physical capital, easy to rebuild. Emotional capital, because once you have a deep drawdown, that fear of, oh my gosh, is that going to happen to me again? Am I going to do that again? It's constantly part of that mental framework. And all you have to go back to is, nope, my rules say X. Now, do we break our rules? Yes. I break my rules. I break my rules probably every day in some tiny way. I'm always managing the risk. But once in a while, I'll go, you know, I just think this is a good place to buy. You know? And invariably, it, I'll be wrong. But my risk management will keep me from going on tilt because I can step out and go, all right, you broke your rules. You made a trade. The mechanics told you you were wrong and you got out. Don't do that again. Let's go to the next one. And I mean, you have a quote, I think, that you, you've said or it's on your site. Our minds are not made to trade. They must be trained to trade. And this sort of fits very nicely into that is that it does take work. And, and especially, and it, and it goes, ties into your background too, because it can be good and bad with the math background because math is about exactness and being specific, right? And markets are anything but that because they, they ebb and flow so much. That's why it was so bad my first few years. It makes yeah. sense. I mean, it's a tough, um, yeah, not many professions. You're just, you're slammed with being wrong, you know, repeatedly by doing the right thing. And it's a tough transition. And being comfortable without knowing that there are things that you don't know, but you still have to act. Yeah, that that's that's a good one too. Yeah. yeah. Um, so if we circle back to the strategy side, do you consider yourself a bottoms up trader or are you looking at things top down market first before individuals? Okay, so by... Top down, do mm -hmm. you mean a uh, big, big, big picture and then dig deep? So, yeah, and I think this would apply, I guess, more to the to the stock side on the swing. But are mm -hmm. you someone that says, OK, the S&P, Dow, Russell, they all look good. Market yes. breadth, it looks good. Long term looks good. Now I can go down to individual stocks. Or are you just saying, hey, this 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 Lulu, you know, yeah. lemon stock, so this thing's awesome. I don't care what the market's doing. Right. So what I'll do is I'll start looking at a stock and I'll say, listen, this looks great, but it's, we need to wait until people are trying to fall over to get out. And then we're going to watch it fall into a deep support area and we're going to start buying. Mm. And so that means we have to wait right? One of my favorite things to do is wait for a deep pullback and then sell out of the money puts way off in the future. Mm -hmm. And so it sort of gives me the double cushion of already a higher priced put that I can sell and I'm already at a support level. So I, I'm a person that often gets left out of the big runs. Does it bother me psychologically? Yes, it does. But I think to myself, would I rather be in a trade that I set up for or wishing I was out of a trade that I didn't set up for that I'm in? The other one is a big psychological drain. And so what I will always focus on is having a little bit of dry powder. And so that, you know, like for Riot, um, they're a blockchain company, right? Mm -hmm. So we looked at them and... We picked it up at $4. Great. I was like, yes. It moves to 35 which is right at the peak. And I go, let's get out of here. And then it goes to 70 
So, <laughs> yeah. So waiting, it's finally come back to those old areas that it was breaking out at old resistance become support. So I'm going to sort of watch it for a little bit, see how it comes in with the market being a little sideways, and then we'll start adding a few more of those out of the money puts. But that's really what I will do. I will like, I didn't even know AMC was on a Reddit board, <laughs> but I went and I thought, you know, why don't we sell some AMC puts for like a dollar? What I mean, people are going to go back to the movies eventually. I right. mean, what are, what are all our Hollywood stars going to do, right? <laughs> They're going to force things back to the movies. And so I was just thinking, wow, that's been beat up. Let's do that. And so really that's what will – the market has to make sense to me. But as I work with stocks, I also have to go – is this an event where they're throwing the baby out with the bathwater? Right now, there are some places, of course, that haven't held as well. Like, I love the drones. UAVS is another one. It's just really very interesting drone technology because they can do it with so much. And I thought, oh, yeah, this, we picked that up also at about four. But it went up. And I thought, oh, you know what? It'll come back and hold 11, 12, and then we'll start stabilizing. Well, it's fallen to six or something. And so it's always that space where you go, you know, I know this is supposed to do this, but it's not. So I'm always in that orientation space. Observe, orient, 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 orient. Decide whether I'm going to act or not, and then go through the loop every single day all the different thoughts. It's just, it's such a great stabilizing thing because the markets can really put you on tilt. I don't know if you remember Jim Cramer way back in the day, he would say, you don't want to find yourself on the linoleum floor with a bottle of whiskey, right? And so, <laughs> I don't drink, but I just thought about that picture and it always made me laugh when he said it. A long time ago. So you really have to put those things that make you go, you know what? Today's done. I can't do anything about it. I only have tomorrow. I I don't have anything left for today. It's gone. Doesn't matter how much I ponder on it. Tomorrow's the next day. I get up and I do it again. You know, it's just habits are very difficult to break. And they're also easy to make if you're not being conscious about them. Like, you know, let's say you want to lose weight, but every day at 12 o'clock you buy two donuts and a frappuccino. And that's, you have to go, no, now is not the time to do that because I've got to change that habit. And so you just fill in something else, you know. And this is a good way to keep your brain in the box so you don't end up hurting yourself or really being terrible to the people who love you most, right? Which is what happens when we're traders and we have bad days. You know, we we really take it out on our family sometimes and it's really bad. Yeah, they, they don't deserve it. And it's no. just something, yeah, that is the, that is the downside of, of this, if, if yeah. it not in control. Um, yeah. But so when you talk about, I, I like the fact that you are entering trades on your own terms. You're not, yeah. you're not worried about, I mean, obviously, you know, you, you, you wish we could all participate in the riot up to, you know, triple digits or anything else, of course, but you're waiting, you're being patient, which is a key theme, I think, that you're coming back to in your process. Do you find that you are sometimes early on the sell-off? I mean, you've been patient, but in other words, are you are you stepping in early there or do you like to see the stabilization and then it start to resume up after the pullback? You know, if that makes sense? Yes, it does make sense. And Sometimes I will get in too early. However, I'm always thinking that I'm wrong. So 
a lot, I say this to people sometimes and they go, wow, that's really negative. No, I'm just managing the risk. And so I think to myself, all right, it's going to pull back here. But if I'm wrong and the wheels come off the bus and I add, how much am I going to add so that this doesn't materially affect the overall profit of the current trade? Or is this a place that I need to just sit on my hands a little bit more, right? So how might I decide that? Let's say I look at a support edge and I see it on the daily, but I notice on my four hour chart and my 30 minute chart, things look very negative. I'm thinking to myself, our near term participants are all excited about driving this to lower support edges. So I'm going to let it break without putting that limit order in. And sometimes it'll break and start running right back up and I'll go, oh, well, this is trend. So I'm going to add here based on my longer form and it will continue. And sometimes it'll run up so high while I've waited on it that I really can't add back or else it's going to affect that overall cost basis that I, I don't want it to affect. And so what I'll end up doing is selling a put way out in the future. I love, I'm a serial put seller, which is fine and dandy for these kinds of very upward moving markets. But at some point, the rubber is going to meet the road. And so, you know, what does that some point look like? Today might be a good example. A lot of Companies came out, had great earnings yesterday, actually, and today all the charts were down that reported they were down to 3%. So the question then is, if they're saying the reports are good, but then people are responding with a sell, was that baked in? Are we looking at a different kind of environment where we're moving peak to trough, maybe being a little sideways? Those are caution lights. Again, it's that observation, right? Orienting yourself to, wait, this is what I used to see. This is what I'm seeing now. The two are different. Hmm. Let's watch a little bit more. And so I am on the very far side of cautious only because when I first began trading, I wasn't. And you know the old joke? How do you make a small fortune in the market? You start with a big one. And so I just saw everything that I had really dwindling. And, you know, my husband, God bless him. He's like, I think you probably ought to stop because I'm not sure you know what you're doing. Yeah. And he was spot on and probably the only person who could say it to me. Um, And I really sat back and said, wait, what, what is it that you know about the markets? And you know, you can't use causality. So why don't you start figuring out some of this correlation? And that really was when all the fun began. You still had to learn to manage risk because I had never been taught that sort of thing. So managing that risk was important. But once you started saying, oh, you know, the last six times I saw this, then this happened. Last five times I saw that, then this happened. And you get to pinpoint those things and then go, oh, all right, now's a good time to do that. I mean, I like the fact that, and this is something I think a lot of new traders have trouble with, is you are, it sounds like you are adding and taking multiple, you're, you're, you're maneuvering around a position. You're Absolutely. not black and white, all in, yes, all, all out. Yes, all in or all out. I know a lot of people are like that. It is very hard to make that transition, but I think yeah. it is so important where yeah. hey, maybe you want to start a position here as it's coming down into a level yes. you identified, mm-hmm. but hasn't quite proved it. Yeah. Maybe you're only taking 25%. Exactly. And then you're waiting to see what the market gives exactly. you. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And as long as you manage your risk, you right. know, you're not buying that 25% and then watching it fall to the floorboard, right? You have to, at some point, say, listen... I'm going to be held accountable to what happens in my portfolio. And really the way some of us trade our portfolios is that 
we don't hold ourselves accountable at all. And so it'll go off the rails and we'll go, ah, you know what? I'm just not even thinking about it. And I'll just start again tomorrow. And you're making the same mistakes over and over again. And usually that mistake is the failure to identify risk properly and then to manage it on the fly. Yep. That's a great point. So if we switch gears real quick to the future side of things, so you're probably approaching that slightly different. You're not waiting for, you know, 40% pullbacks and growth right, names. Right. You, know, you can't imagine you're doing that in the future. So do you, um, you're, you're trading it on an intraday basis. So I guess two questions for you here. Do you find that futures are a harder, more competitive? What we usually hear is futures are just, there, there's all the, all the liquidities there. The professionals are there. It is a harder battle of of wits of supply demand yeah. versus a five hundred million dollar you know blockchain company. Do you th- do you do you think there's there's truth to that or are you supply and demand? I mean, price is price. This is all fits within my framework for how I view. Yeah, markets. and you know it's interesting. I think the answer is yes, even though you gave me an or question, and so <laughs> um, <laughs> the. It is very competitive and traders will try to run your stops. That is very true. The liquidity being there ends up giving you beautiful examples of supply and demand. And watching them try to force price through places Mm. is very interesting. So like, for instance, if it opens up, in a morning and it's gapped down and there's a gap between the 4 p.m. close and the 9.30 open, gap fillers are going to come in and they're going to try and fill those gaps. And so you can see them trying to get their footing, but if trend is against them, they're either going to fill the gap if it's a small one and then price will collapse or they won't be able to fill the gap at all. And so if you know, hey, that's what they're going to plan, right? It's sort of like getting up at the plate. I'm a big baseball fan. Getting up at the plate and knowing that the guy that you are up against on the mound just has three pitches. And today he's got no command. And so the only time... He's going to throw a strike after giving me three balls is coming straight down the middle. So I'm looking for the fastball. And so the probability of hitting becomes a lot bigger when you know what pitch is coming, right? That's why the first and second base, or that's why the second and third baseman, and they're all, we're trying to steal what the catcher's doing, right? So <laughs> that's, that is something that is really, really important in the trading space. When the traders come out and they go, all right, here's our line of sand. We know if the big traders come out and say, listen, let's buy this. If it fades, let's buy it. It doesn't matter. We're going to buy it because it's got to hold this level or it's just bounced off of this level. So you can see what the big footprints are doing if you're looking for them much better Hmm. than you might think, though it's the same in stocks. It truly is the same. I don't trade thin volume stock anyway, and I don't trade the tiny ones that can get manipulated Mm -hmm. as well. And so I try to stay out of the place where I don't want to bump into a megalodon. (laughs) (laughs) I think Shark Week was like two weeks ago. So, (laughs) um. So, yeah, I don't want to bump into some big shark coming after me where, you know, I'm unaware. It's just, you know, being a little sun perched sure. swimming out there. So, yeah. Yeah, it makes sense. I mean, even like you say, with, with that added liquidity, when you see things like stop runs or a break of support and it suddenly rejects or or like that is clues. Those are clues. Those yeah. are footprints. You're seeing the real sort of dynamics at work yeah, there. So yeah, that does so. make, yeah, that does make quite a lot of sense. Are you, um, 
you know, over the past year or so, is there anything that you've newly added or thinking about in terms of your trading approach or how you frame up markets? Or are you sort of just doubling down on the classic, you know, trader psychology and, you know, market behavior? I would say what I love to look at, and it's not a, it's not a new thing per se. It just has my level of focus. I always talk about, hey, did you notice where the week closed last week? Did you notice where it opened? Did you notice where last month closed? Mm. Did you notice where it opened? And realize that everybody putting money together in the market has an agenda. You know, we just don't throw it out. I mean, a lot of retail traders will just go, oh, no, let's see what happens. Big money can't do that because their clients will go, you can't have any more of my money. And so they are really held to that level. And so the big thing is, can you watch and see when they say, this is the space I'm going to act? And they'll very often act as, where did the month close? We're above it? Great. Let's keep acquiring as long as we stay above. We're below it? Well, let's, how did last week do? Let's kind of chill out for a little bit. Let's see what happens right there. If we come into last week's close, are we going to bounce there or are we going to see more fade? And again, it's, we have a tendency to buy or sell and ask questions later hmm. when the big money manager is thinking it through. Yep. What kind of order flow should we see at this support zone? Nibble out here for a few hundred contracts, a few thousand contracts, and let's see what happens in this order flow, right? Because they're moving battleships. We're so lucky. We get to be little zodiacs in and out. We can do anything we want. Somebody has 10 million shares they've decided to trim down on. You can't put them all out in the market at the same time. It's going to be bad. That gives us such a great advantage mm. that we just need to start looking for it. And what we can look for it by seeing, okay, what are they trying to do with these wicks? What are they trying to do with these edges? Are we drifting down? Because there's somebody very patient waiting for either the very highs because they know something's going on or the very lows because they know something's going on. So you've been trading now for, let's see, 15, 20, getting close to 20 yeah, years. Yeah, close to 20 now. years. Yeah. I have a lot less hair. <laughs> you've published a book, which- A couple of them. A couple of them. I, yeah. you know, And I looked up on Amazon. So I think you published your book on July 14th, 2011, your first one, if I'm not mm -hmm. mistaken. Mm -hmm. And I have the purchase date that Amazon has on there of July 15th. So I was the day after on getting that nice. book. And it is still a great framework Thanks. for someone yeah. that is getting started and needs yeah. to kind of get a lay of the land of how things work. Uh, yeah. It's a great book to jumpstart your sort of path into, into this world. You saying that. So what does, after all of that, and, and you speak a lot and, and, um, you know, where you are now, what does successful trading look like to you? And is it something where you're trying to still push and get more returns and improve? Are you trying to slow down and coast a little bit? Where are you and what does successful trading look like to you? Again, another one of those or questions that has a yes on it. Um, so am I, parts of me are trying to slow down. I used to trade, make 40, 50 trades a day. I just can't. Oh, wow. yeah. My, my first year, I spent $200,000 on, on fees. Remember when you had to pay for commissions? Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. <laughs> not that long yeah. ago. And we still pay for them on the future side, but yeah. you know they're not nearly as bad as they used to be. So sure. um, I do trade less. I want to try every day. I'm always making sure that my process is still clean. And as you know, although I'm in observe, orient, decide, act, that 
what I observe and how that observation translates into execution changes over time because I'm always observing. Oh, I haven't seen it do that before. I haven't watched that happen before. I haven't seen this before. And so that sort of thing, um, I'm always tweaking, but keeping myself from, you know, in, in the early days, what we would do is we would become the salad bar traders that we go a little bit of this and a little bit of that and we, t- and we put it in and it's none of them work together and it's all just a mess. And so learning that less is more every day, even today, I go, oh, I don't need that. That's something mm. I can consider on the weekend. But in terms of the active analysis, I don't have to worry about that. I understand what's going on right there. And so that is uh, very comforting. And I do like slowing down. So I I used to never take vacations, really, Mm. for the first five, six years. I Well, that's not true, never. I would take a week here, a week there. And so this past year, I took, you know, probably two months off right? I was in Bora Bora for three weeks. I just had just done a lot more uh, adventure living in that space to bring myself to balance. Because this is a business that, you know, if you say the word balance, it just doesn't fit, right? It's all or not. You give it all or you're not going to get anything that you want. It truly is like professional sports. There are things you're going to have to sacrifice to get good at the game. And if you decide it's worth it, great. If you decide it's not great, but for me, I gave it all of that. And I'm now at the space where I can go, you know what? I can pull back a little bit. I feel guilty, but you know, that's part of my sky cab of baggage back there. So, you know, I, I do like this thought of continually trying to do more with less. And the more I look at the candlesticks and the more I think about price action, the more the more I see that so much of what I used to look at is noise and not signal at all. You know, I like the, it's back to the patience, it's back to the balance, yeah. taking care of yourself. Yes. I mean, it all ties in and it's... Um, to make it sustainable, right? Otherwise, you burn out and everything else. Is there anything we didn't get a chance to talk about? Anything else on the top of your mind or anything else you've been working on that you want to speak to now? You know, I I think what, you know, as traders listen to this work that you're putting together for them to help them with everything, um, it's important to set realistic expectations and to realize that more reward always requires more risk. And risk and reward sit on a string, and you've got a little bead in the center of it, and if you move it to one side, the other side is going to handle whatever is left there. So you want a lot of risk, you can get a lot of reward and a lot of pain. So thinking about it like that and realizing that the trading game is a marathon. Take a look at all the gray beards out there that we watch on television. You know, they're, I mean, a lot of them have hit rates of like 50%, 56%, but they've been doing it for 50 years, for heaven's sakes. And we somehow have this idea that the market is some kind of lottery ticket. And although there are some wonderful days that you can get in and go, wow, was that nice? Most of the time, it's hard work day in, day out, just like the professional baseball player, the professional basketball player. You've got to put time on the practice field, which is the most boring thing in the world, 
before you get out on the playing field. And most of us are like, yeah, you know what? Forget that practice. Let's just get out here. Right. And then you find yourself being carted off the field in a stretcher. So (laughs) right. Metaphorically speaking, of course, but you know, it's the same sort of thing. And so newer traders, Listen, manage your risk so that you can learn over the long haul and realize that there are some places you're going to have some amazing runs. But if you do not manage the risk, eventually it's going to come back and bite you. And even the great Jesse Livermore, who had so many things to say, broke his own rules and it's why he ended up taking his own life. And how dreadful is that? Yeah. But it's really a lesson in, hey, hold yourself accountable to your strategies and your systems and your risk. And you're never going to be, you know, on the linoleum floor with that <laughs> bottle of whiskey. <laughs> so it's so important, though. I mean, the managing risk, patience, observe, orient decide, act, repeat. I mean, that's it. That's trading, yeah. right? And 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 the balance and you said it at the end there, the balance of reward and risk. It's yeah. it's just that's the game. And yeah, I I truly I respect. I mean, anyone that I run into that has been trading for, you know, 15 plus years and are still trading, they have my yeah. full attention and they have my respect because they survived. That. Right? Yeah, it I is mean, really a survival space. Uh, yeah. And you have to focus on that. And the only way you can focus on that is by managing how much you let yourself lose. Yeah. Well said. Where can people find you if they want to learn more about your work or what you're up to? What's the best place for them to go to? You can find me on social media. I'm at Anne Marie Trades. You can email me at uh, info at the tradingbook.com or you can visit the tradingbook.com or you can see me floating around Benzinga here or there. Um, <laughs> and, uh, yeah, I'm, I, I love hearing from folks. Um, I try not to share platitudes. Mm-hmm. Um, and I really try to give straight direction in terms of, you know, here, here's what I would say about that. But trading is an individual game. Mm-hmm. You're going to have to find your own rhythm and what what speaks to you in terms of cycles and what you want to follow. And it's worth getting to the practice field to figure out what that is so that when you get to the playing field and the real game where the money is at stake, where you feel very personally about your money, mm-hmm. you're going to be more equipped mentally to handle what's happening in the market. Hmm. Well said. Anne-Marie, thank you so much for taking the time today. My pleasure. Being here. It's great to have you. Thanks for tuning in and we'll see you in the next episode. Okay, we are back here with a E-mini S&P 500 chart, and Anne-Marie is going to talk us through a pretty cool setup and sort of lens on how she's viewing the market. So Anne-Marie, take it away on what we're looking at. All right. Thanks very much. I sure will. So what I wanted to share was what a market does when it's changing direction. If we notice to the very left of the chart, you can see there's a fade action that comes down and we eventually build a support zone. And sometimes when we're looking at candlesticks, we just stare at them and we really sort of focus on our technical indicator. We look at a moving average or something like that, when really the candlestick is going to tell you everything that you need to know. So for instance, if we take a look at this formation, you can see that as it's falling, there's a first level of support and then the chart bounces. And then there's a second level of support. And this is on the very left of the chart. You'll see that on this second level of support, it bounces and breaches the old area of support that was previously identified. Mm -hmm. That's one of the first things that a chart changing direction will do. It will fail to head lower, and then it will recapture 
old support that had broken down. And then the next thing it does is pull back and hold the higher support. So the big question is, well, if I'm staring at that, where do I enter this trade? And so that all depends on the kind of risk that you're looking at. Let's say you look at it and you say, you know what? I want to wait until the candle closes above my old area of support. Then it would be the first green clear candlestick mm -hmm. to that right side where you would get involved. Mm -hmm. If you are the type of trader that wants to squeeze the edge of what you have available as risk to make it as small as possible, as it comes in, you look to that first area of support and you say, how close can I trade? Mm. How close can I get this buy zone? And so that's a nice clean motion that tells us we have an updraft. The same thing happens on the downdraft, mm. and that is where the Fibonacci begins. You can see the little candlesticks here only fail to hold lower, excuse me, fail to hold higher after the big, deep drop to that resistance line that becomes support. Mm -hmm. So if you're thinking of that, your thought must be, okay, one, I fail to head higher. Two, I break my old support zone, and that means on the bounce, I have to fail to breach the prior resistance zone that's sitting up there on the top, and there it is right there at the end of that green hollow candlestick. And so you can say on the very next candle, I'm going to go short. Your thought must be, where are you going to? Because you just made a new high out of this low. So mm. again, you orient, uh, you observe, hey, this is rolling over. That orientation tells you if you are in a space that's going to give you a bigger drawdown or a place that's going to likely test support. Mm. If you've broken your recent resistance, it means buyers are at play. So you better be looking for your old support that became resistance on mm -hmm. the first pass, but then made a brand new support. Mm -hmm. You're going to look for those edges to hold. And you're going to see if you draw a line straight across, you're going to see it come right above that candlestick that you first entered in that green candlestick on the long there. And mm -hmm. so it tells you buyers are going to be in there. And if you take a short on that bounce, you better take some profit. Hmm. Because again, as soon as you fail to head lower and you breach resistance, you're off to the running. Hmm. So when you look at the candlesticks immediately and you think about things like that, like in the current environment we have, it's a lot of noise. Yeah. We are failing to hold higher in some of these cases, but we're not really breaking support. We're just coming in and testing them. And so what this does is keep us out of the trade where we go, no, this is my short. Hmm. And it winds us up and our risk gets really big. Whenever you have charts that are not heading higher, except for every other day, mm -hmm. but they're still holding their support zones, they're going to grind higher to the north. And so instead of you going, no, this is where my risk is, I'm going to take a short here, you start thinking about what do I need to do? I need to watch my old support levels break down and then watch them bounce. And that's exactly what's happened in the chart, particularly as we look at today's motion. We can see it fading off of those zones and sitting at the bottom of that support line. We still don't know whether this chart is going to run up or not. But what we see it doing is one, making a lower high but just jamming up at that support where everybody is saying, hey, listen, I'm buying this. It might dip a little, but this is bullish action. Old resistance, new support, that 4179, 4175, that area, 
I'm going to come in. If it dips, I'm going to buy that dip. I'm going to buy no matter what that dip is. And I'm going to watch the bounce. And I'm going to hope that I close over a specific level, whatever you want that level to be, whether you're a swing or an intraday trader. Mm -hmm. And so always focus on these candlesticks and what the traders are, are doing. And your daily candlesticks, I trade intraday. And the only levels I look at are daily high open close, mm -hmm. weekly high open close, and monthly high open close. No other levels. I love it. And if my Fibonacci matches those, it's going to be a good zone for me to watch. And if my Fibonacci's don't, I'm going to see the zones that are near the open high low close, and I'm going to anticipate that somebody's going to try to run in with a wick somewhere. Mm. And what's great about this is it is totally applicable to every stock, every, commodity, every single one, any free market that's trading. I mean, yes. that is Forex, applicable. crypto, yep. anything. And it's really, it's because of us being humans and trading those same levels. We're going to look for where resistance becomes new support. <laughs> and we're going to go, hey, that, that looks like a good place for me to establish a position without a lot of risk. I don't want to buy the new highs. Um, and everything is still essentially moving up. It's really, it's simple. Trading is not easy, but we can make it simple so all the other mental gyrations we have around risk and what it is that we're worrying about emotionally being wrong, you know, we can pull ourselves into a space where we go, no, it's a Forrest Gump trade. I just, <laughs> for me, if, see, I'm even wearing my little blue shirt. I got to get the cream pants on the bottom. So it's just the, it is, it's the Forrest Gump trade. Simple, just so that your brain can work around everything else because we're not machines. And a lot of times we, Input, 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 input. We're going to crash, right? We're analog. We are not digital. And so we we have to adapt to that and realize that more is not better. And more is not required. And thinking about less being more is so out of our Western mindset that we think surely... There's got to be more than that. And yes, there is, but that's risk. And as long as you manage it, it doesn't matter why it happened. You're not concerned about that wheelhouse. Your wheelhouse is, am I holding that support? And is that support moving me to enter the trade with that small amount of risk? Awesome. Thanks so much again, Anne-Marie. You can My learn pleasure. more about her trading at thetradingbook.com. Thanks so much. Thanks, Thank you for listening to Smarter Trading. I hope you enjoyed this week's episode. For all of the show notes, links, and call outs, head on over to thetraderisk.com forward slash podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please leave us a rating and review on iTunes. Smarter Trading is hosted by me, Evan Medeiros, and produced by Ashton Alexander. Thanks for tuning in, and we hope to see you in the next episode.